of, of people having to uh, uh, separate at times. But uh, Paul also tells in Hebrews that we should not, Hebrews chapter 10, do not neglect the forsaking of yourselves together. And as you're going to see in our study this morning, before we move into the communion service, that uh, a big part of worship in the Bible surrounded people gathering together for a meal or a feast. And the title of today's message is A Sacred Supper. And it'll be a little shorter than our normal sermon because we also have the, um, the communion aspect to follow. But um, the Bible begins and ends with food. Of course, the first meal that Eve ate, it didn't go well. In the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus begins and ends with a marriage feast. And uh, that's sort of just a very important part of life. The message, A Sacred Supper, is our title today. And I thought I'd share some stories with you in the beginning. Uh, I, I read, this was both a bitter and a sweet story. In February 19, 2015, a mother, Ashley Barati, she sent invitations to all of the 16 classmates of her six-year-old six son, Glenn. And when the time came for the party, nobody showed up. Uh, when she realized no one was coming, she was so sad, she vented to some of her friends on Facebook, who I guess began to share it, and with a matter of minutes, it went viral, because her st son struggled with autism, and here they had a birthday party, and she talked about how broken-hearted he was. They set up for this party, had food and provisions, and nobody came. That would be heartbreaking for any mother, special looking at the face of a child. Well, what happened, though, is that it spread so quickly that even people in the police department saw it, and they said, let's do something for that boy. And they found out where he was, and they went and flew the helicopter over and called out and waved, and, and the firefighters in town came, and the policemen in town came and gave presents, and all the mothers in the neighborhood, maybe they didn't have kids in the same school, they came, and out of nowhere, a party materialized uh, because people's hearts were touched by all of that. Barati told the local newspaper, you don't know how much this means to us. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus wants to sup with us. He told Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down, for today I must abide at your house. Now, the Lord wants to have an intimate relationship with us. And it's interesting, something happens when you eat with somebody. It's different. I mean, sometimes people will make business deals and it's all on the phone and the fax machine, well, no one has a fax machine anymore, but you know, contracts. And, but when someone says, let's, let's get together and have a meal, uh, there's something about the, the pleasant aspect of getting that nourishment that you need to say, stay alive and sharing that experience with someone else that uh, is, it's intimate, it's important, it's pleasant, it's healthy if you're eating the right food. It's healthy to eat as opposed to not eating. But uh, God's invited us to a very important meal, and it's a sad thing when people say, I don't want to come. And just like that mother was brokenhearted when uh, no one came to her son's feast, the Bible tells a story about a king. You can look with me in the book of Luke chapter 15. It's actually Luke 14. Luke 14, 16. And Jesus said, A certain man gave a great supper, and he invited many. And he sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited. Ostensibly, they got the invitation and said, Sure, I'll be there. Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must go see it. Oh, didn't you look at it before you bought it? I ask you, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. Again, you didn't test drive your pickup before you bought it. I'm going to buy five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. See, as you and I would think that's sort of a lame excuse today, it was lame the way it's written. I ask you, have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Well, I'm sure the king would let her come. And they all began to make excuses. Now, how did the king feel about that? 
So that servant came and he reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry and hurt, he said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And so the servants did as was said, and they came back and said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and there's still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in to my house that it may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited will taste my supper. That's a very, I think, important lesson for us. You notice one thing about the feast. Never does it say they run out of room or they run out of provisions. There's plenty of room in the family of God. The Lord has invited all of us to be part of that marriage supper of the Lamb, but um, you accept the invitation now and then you live a life like you're planning on going to that event. And so many people just become preoccupied with the cares of this life. So that day takes them as a thief. And um, in another similar parable, the Lord says, uh, none of those that were invited will taste my feast. And the king sends an army and destroys them because it's an insult. Not only that, he not only provides the food, he provides the place. The Bible tells, tells us he provides the garment to wear. You can't say, well, I have nothing to wear, I can't go. I know people sometimes don't come to church. They say, I have nothing to wear. And, uh, well, we want people to be, you know, we don't want anyone to get arrested for indecent exposure, but if you don't have perfect clothing, we, we still want you to come. Amen? Amen? Come to Jesus. Well, in the Bible, we find that meals were especially important because there were times where he would ratify covenants. Agreements were sealed. Look, for instance, in the story of Abraham. Genesis 18, Lord Jesus himself and two angels came and met with Abraham. And uh, oh, there's a big building, had a fly buzzing around. <laughs> Go over there. By, by the <laughs> I don't have to worry about him landing on my white hair. <laughs> so God told Abraham, um, what was going to happen? He renewed the covenant. And it says, he took butter and milk and a calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And then God makes a promise, and he says, I certainly will return to you according to the time of life. Sarah, your wife, will have a son, whose name was Isaac. Now Isaac, when he passes on the birthright, how does he do that? Well, he's getting ready to do it with Esau. He says, before I bless you, going to eat. Go catch me some wild venison. Rebecca hears this. She says to Jacob, I want you to get the blessing. I'll put a calf in. I'll season it. Your father will never know the difference. And uh, so it's in the context of a meal. You can read here in Genesis 27, verse 25. Isaac said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him. He ate. He brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said, come near now and kiss me, my son. He came near, he kissed him. And he gives the blessing to Jacob in the context of a feast. Look at the story of Jacob. And when Jacob had to flee from Laban's house and they finally caught up with him. Genesis 31, 44. Now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let, let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a, took a stone and set up a pillar and Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones, they made a heap, they ate on this heap of stones, and they ratified a covenant never to cross that stone pile to do each other harm. Again, promise made, ratified with a meal. Joseph, after all of the intrigue and the gauntlet of things that he put his brothers through, finally reveals himself to his brothers. And it's interesting that he does it in a meal. He does it in a meal where you've got the 12 brothers gathered together, and a cup plays prominently in the story. Did Jesus sit around a table with 12 apostles, and there was a cup that played prominently in the story? Genesis 43, verse 16. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, 
Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal, make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. And it's ultimately following that meal that Joseph says to his stunned brother, first time he speaks to them in Hebrew, says, I am Joseph, does my father yet live? And they were thunderstruck. They were flabbergasted. But it's following a meal. There's a revelation that's made. You notice what's happening? Covenants are made. And uh, contracts are made. And meals were very important occasions in Bible times. Just before Jesus died, it was at a feast in Simon's house. Mary Magdalene comes, kneels at his feet. She not only anoints his feet with oil, she pours some on his head. You compare the Gospels. She weeps and dries his feet with her tears. You know, Christ was anointed before his sacrifice by Mary. The word Christ means anointed. He's anointed. Baptized in the Jordan before he died, he's baptized in the tears of a woman who represents the church, saying basically that he was walking in our sorrows when he went to the cross. That's happen happening all at a meal. It was at a meal, the same meal, a matter of fact, that Judas was offended. When Judas said, leave her alone, she's done a good thing for me, because Judas is the one that said, well, what a waste of money. He could have sold that perfume and got 300 denarii, a year's wages. And when Jesus rebuked him for saying that, Judas went from that meal and covenanted with the um, high priest to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. Interesting things happen at these meals, according to the Bible. Meals are also occasions for announcements. Families do that. They invite everybody over, and they've got a big secret, and everybody gets together, and the young man and the young lady tap on the glass and say, we got a little announcement to make. We're getting engaged, or we're getting married, or we eloped last week. I don't know what the announcement but they make these big announcements. <laughs> or we're expecting. And uh, it's often at these dinner occasions that people come together, and they, they make an announcement. I got the big job. I just wanted to tell everyone together uh, when we can celebrate at a meal. And so meals are often times like that. It's sometimes at a meal that people uh, are reconciled. Say, so let me take you to lunch. Let's, let's have a meal together. You read in Matthew 9, 9, talks about, and Matthew, this happened to him, and he's writing about it. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he walked away from his cash register, and he followed him. Now it happened that Jesus sat at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners, these are friends of Matthew, they came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners, publicans and sinners? Jesus showed this intimacy in that he was willing to eat with them. And yeah, people like Zacchaeus and like Matthew, he wants to reach them. And sometimes you've got to go to where the people are. You know, I've, I love history. And I've just read several books lately of great missionaries that go to uh, very primitive people. And sometimes they encounter people for the first time that have never seen Western missionaries. First, they don't know whether they're going to get speared or what's going to happen. But when they sit down and they offer them something to eat, it breaks the ice, they become friends. As soon as they eat together, there's something about it. I was looking for words to try to explain it, but something happens. There's a connection. I think it's important for families in our busy culture today to try as hard as possible to re reserve time where the family eats together. And everyone is just coming and going so much, and, and Karen will testify that uh, Nathan's living in his own apartment now until last week, but we're all living together. And I'd always say, here's when I'm eating. I hope you can join me. We can do it together. Because everybody's so busy. A lot of families, they never sit down and share a meal together. And that's when you talk about, well, how's it going? What's happening? And it's important for us to have those connections. It seems like every important occasion in life, weddings, you have a feast, Sometimes following funerals, people get together for, for a meal. That uh, one of the great miracles of Jesus was multiplying bread. 
We see this theme through the Bible. Even after the resurrection, listen to this, Acts chapter 10, verse 40. Him God raised on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. It's interesting, Jesus continued to prove he was real by doing what? He ate. Something that's very natural and normal. Was he said, I'm not a ghost. What have you got to eat? So he's trying to emphasize to them, he's real. Luke 24, verse 30. It came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and he blessed it. This is after the resurrection. And he gave it to them. Their eyes were open, they knew him, and he vanished. It's at the very moment he breaks bread and hands it to them, he reveals who he is, and poof, he disappears. Again, at a meal. I could go on and on, friends. All through the Bible. And then you can read again Luke 24, 41. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food to eat? And he eats in front of them. In John 21, again, he meets them up by the Sea of Galilee, and he's on the shore. And he says, children, have you caught any fish? And they finally come ashore, and he's already got stuff cooking. While he's there, he says, come eat breakfast. And he's revealing himself to them in the context of meal. Now, all of this sort of meets its intersection. This all comes together in the experience of the last week. Christ said, I'm going to Jerusalem for the Passover. What was the Passover? Well, the Passover was a sacred meal that commemorated their deliverance from slavery. The children of Israel, after hundreds of years being slaves in Egypt, Moses comes and says, let my people go. A whole kaleidoscope of plagues falls upon the Egyptians. And Pharaoh would say, okay, I'll let him go. And then he'd change his mind. And he would say, no, I'm not going to let him go. And finally, after all these devastating plagues, the 10th plague comes. And Moses said, all of the firstborn are going to die throughout the land of Egypt. There's only one way you can escape. You need to slaughter this lamb. You take the blood of the lamb, you put it on the doorposts, the lentil of the home, and when that angel of judgment comes through the land, he will see the blood and pass over. That's where you get the name Passover. And if you didn't have the blood, there'd be death in that family, sometimes multiple deaths. But not only did they offer a lamb, they were to eat that lamb. Now, you understand the analogy there. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whenever we participate in the Lord's Supper, and for those who may be visiting in our church, we practice what we call open communion. If you have accepted Christ, you are welcome to join us today in this uh, celebration. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's not that, you know, if, when you eat the, the little, the wheat, uh, the wheat wafer, or you drink the grape juice, that suddenly it's infusing you with some new medical power of life. It represents faith, that you have faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, that through faith in his shed blood, that you want his life and his word in you, that bread represents the word of God in us, that it has a transforming power that through that faith, that angel of judgment goes by and you are forgiven. He sees you as righteous because of the blood of Jesus. That's a wonderful truth, friends. Amen. Thus you shall eat it. How did they eat the Passover? With a belt on your waist and sandals on your feet and a staff in your hand. See, when you accept Christ, you begin a journey. After they ate that meal, they began a journey. By the way, very important for us, Seventh-day Adventists are sometimes accused of being legalistic because we, keep, we believe in keeping all Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. But it's very important to know that we don't believe that. We believe we're saved by faith. But we believe if we are saved by faith, we'll want to obey all of them, especially the one that says, don't forget this one, you think. And um, were the children of Israel saved from Egypt by the law or by the lamb? They ate the lamb in Egypt. 
They were saved. They got out of Egypt, saved from their slavery. After they were saved, God gives them the law. And he says, if you love me, I'm the God that saved you. Keep my commandments. So that's why we do it. Just like the other churches believe in the other commandments, we believe in all of them. And, but we believe we're saved entirely by faith and grace. Can you say amen? Amen. Just so for those listening and watching, I wanted some testimony from you that I'm not just saying this. So then you had the Passover meal. Now notice with that background, in Luke 22, at the end of Christ's ministry, when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles and he said to them, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The communion service was a Passover. That's not an accident because Christ is the lamb. I say to you that I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And Matthew, Jesus said, you know, take this wine, which is new, the shedding of my blood, it says, I will not drink of it until I drink it with you again, new in the Father's kingdom. So one reason that this is so special is it's reminding us that we are going to eat and drink with the Son of God in the kingdom. He says, I'm not going to eat again until then. We're looking forward to that event, and it's a sign of that. And then, of Christ, of course, it says in Luke 22, verse 19, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We've got a direct command to do this. Likewise, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. You know, in looking up uh, amazing facts, uh, I ran into one, some of you see my Facebook page, you may have seen this last night. It's about the most expensive restaurant in the world. It's in uh, Ibiza, Spain, Ibiza, Spain. It's an island off the uh, eastern coast of Spain. I've been near there in Port of Mahon, but I've never been there. They've got a restaurant that's called Sublimotion, and it's over $2,000 per person. And uh, that's one place you don't want to fight for the check at the end of the meal. <laughs> Maximum of 12 guests, interesting number, sit around one table and receive 15 courses. They're small because you'd be uncomfortably stuffed after two or three. How many of you are full of chips by the time the burrito shows up? <laughs> you just, oh, I'm glad I'm not alone. I just, it's so hard. Once you eat one chip, it's like you're going, when's that food going to come? And, <laughs> Okay, so you get 15 courses of food plus dessert prepared by some of the world's best chefs. The testimony of the Herlines of the food is incredible. Uh, some of it I could not eat. I wish they had a vegan option, but I still couldn't afford it. And it's much more than food. The whole room is an immersive experience. The, the room is a high-definition 3D uh, screen in the table. And the environment changes with every course, everything from your undersea and they had incredible IMAX photography of your, you know, you whales and sharks swimming around you and, and uh, coral reef, and then you're in this beautiful fantasy forest, and, and uh, you're going through different times and, and things with every meal that you're eating, and at some point, when the next course comes, you're shocked because it's lowered from the ceiling on these little pulleys. And then your dessert comes out, and it spins levitates on your plate, on your tray. And it's just the whole thing is supposed to be just an amazing experience to eat that meal. Most expensive meal in the world. Not really. Most expensive meal in the world is the one that costs the life of the Son of God. So when Jesus died for us, John chapter 6, 53, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. By the way, after Christ made this statement, it says many stopped following him. I mean, Christ was not endorsing cannibalism. It's pretty clear what he's talking about, but they didn't understand it. And I will raise him up in the last day. He's talking about the resurrection. We must accept the covenant that he's making with us. The Lord's Supper is our accepting and ratifying that we accept, we believe the covenant, or renewing it, and we need to renew it. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. That's basically talking about Christ in you. How does Jesus get in you? The words that I have spoken, they are spirit and they are life. He gets in us through his words and through his spirit. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not at, oh, by the way, notice he says he lives by the word of the Father. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. This is just such a wonderful promise, friends, that he's provided that for us. A couple more amazing facts. Talked about the most expensive dinner. The most expensive feast in the world happened recently. One of the richest men in the world, he's the richest man in Asia, Mukesh Abami. He's got a home that costs, I think, over a billion dollars. He had a wedding for his 27-year-old daughter, Isha Abami. The cost was $100 million for the wedding feast. But he will not feel it. He has $43 billion. That was December 16. The largest number of people to ever attend the feast, and this is also India, was a famous Indian movie star named Jalalitha Jarim. I'm sure I said that wrong. Uh, a movie star from Tamil Nadu and chief minister, she, not having any children, hosted a banquet for 150,000 guests at her foster son's wedding in the 50-acre grounds of Madras. And uh, it cost $23 million to feed everybody. Those are big feasts. But that's nothing compared to the feast you've been invited to. The Bible tells us in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. What does Jesus want to do? Let me into your heart. I want to dine with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to share that pleasant experience of eating great food, the fruit of life. Revelation 19.6 and I heard, as it was, a voice of a great multitude, and the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true sayings of God. You are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is going to outshine any earthly feast. And it costs more than any earthly restaurant. And you will be able to sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and eat with the Son of God. Isn't that wonderful? And whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, he's reminding us of that. But, you know, before we get to participate in that um, wonderful occasion, that great exalted experience, there's a humbling that happens before. Luke 12, 37, Blessed are those servants when the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Imagine that Jesus said, I will serve thee. Of Jesus for your waiter? Tells you about the spirit of service that you have in heaven. Christ said, I've come to you as one that serves. He illustrates this, and you only find this in the Gospel of John, but that's enough for me. It tells us not only did they have the Lord's Supper, it was a custom back then that before they ate the Passover, they usually had a servant wash their feet. You, you and I always wash our hands before we eat, probably more in the last two years than usual. Uh, but they would also wash their feet. Not that they ate with their feet, but they had been walking on roads that were not paved back then, usually wearing sandals, and they shared the road with the animals, and I won't give you any more detail than that. But it may not smell very good if you're going to come and enjoy the aroma of good food if your feet smelled like the road. And so they would wash their feet uh, before they came together for the sacred supper. 
Well, when they got to the upper room, the disciples had made provision and the, the food was there, the utensils, everything they were going to need. They had basins and towels and things for the servants to wash their feet. Jesus said, this is a personal meal. I just want you and me, just the 13 of us there. And they got up there and they realized, oh, there's no servant. But someone's got to wash feet. Well, the disciples had been arguing among themselves which of them would hold the highest position in the kingdom of God. And so uh, Judas said, I'm, I'm not washing anybody's feet. I'm going to be the treasure. That will be demeaning. It will give the wrong image, not good branding for me. And James and John, they'd asked to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus. He said, no, that's, I'm going to act like we don't see that basin and towel over there. One of these guys will do it. And they all ignored it. And while they're thinking these thoughts, and it was very awkward wondering who's going to wash the feet, Jesus went and picked up the towel. He tucked in his robe, and they were astonished and humbled as he then went to them one by one and began to wash their feet. And when he got to Peter, you remember, Peter was aghast, and he said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. This isn't right. You know, you're the Lord. And Jesus said, um, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Thinking about that, Peter said, okay, Lord, wash my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said, no, if you're, you've been washed by my blood, but your feet still need to be washed. And uh, Christ then made a statement when this all happened. After he finished washing their feet, this is John 13, 12. He took his garments, he sat down again. He said, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This is as clear as it could be. He says the very same thing he says about the bread and the wine. You should do this in remembrance of me. I've given you an example. He said, I assuredly, a servant is not greater than his master, nor he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. And in our church, as uh, several other Protestant churches used to do, if you look into it historically, we practice foot washing. A number of churches have given it up. We haven't. Before we come back to participate, which we will in just a few minutes, the Lord's Supper, we go and gather in uh, two or three groups, and we wash each other's feet. And if you're a visitor here, you might think, well, that's kind of strange. I remember the first time I saw that done. And I lived in the cave, and my feet needed washing back then. And uh, I, I thought, I want to watch this first and, and see. But it's a beautiful service where we really humble ourselves. A good time for us to confess our faults to one another and pray for one another. I don't mean we don't believe in that kind of confession. But if you've got anybody you're at odds with, you ought to be reconciled to them. The Bible talks about that in 1 Corinthians, that when they would celebrate the supper, and it says we ought to wash one another's feet several places in the Bible. So we still practice that. And it's a good time also for us to remember this is a sacred occasion. Uh, we have, I would like to have us put a map up on the screen. And uh, you see, this is kind of an outline of the main floor in the sanctuary. The yellow there is the kitchen and the fellowship hall. We'll have two groups there. There'll be a place for couples to wash feet. Maybe you'd like to do this with your, your spouse. And also for the men, the women will be in the area that's outlined there in lavender, I guess, and that is our chapel, which is to my left over at the end of the hall down here. And the basins and everything you need will be there. Uh, when you're in there, it's wonderful if people take up a song or hymn. Sometimes we know at least one verse by heart and uh, pray with the person that you're, you're washing their feet. And uh, remember the sacredness of this occasion. Uh, you know, we're going to divide in just a moment to do this, but I wonder if we could stand together before we do. And I'd like to pray with you. And then how many of you know the chorus, just the chorus of Turn Your Eyes on Jesus? We're going to be doing that a cappella. I saw Michelle grab the, she grabbed her hymnal. And she's going to run up and play because I didn't tell her about this. But uh, let me pray with you. Let's sing the chorus of that, and then we'll be dividing off into groups. And... Uh, if you have children, if, if you think you're safe letting them stay here, we'd like to ask the children either stay with you or stay in here. We have someone that's going to bring them a children's story during that time. Let's pray. Loving Father, 
we are so thankful for the, the sacrifice that Jesus made that we might renew this covenant, knowing that our sins are washed away and, and we will have eternal life, Lord. We pray that you bless right now so that we might embrace all that you have in store for us through this sacred right that you've given your people. Lord, I pray that we'll have hearts and minds that are humble. If there's anything in our lives where, uh, if there's sin that needs to be confessed and forsaken, that this will be the starting point for that freedom. We pray if there's anybody that we need to reconcile with, we'll do that now or determine to contact them and, and be reconciled and forgive each other. Uh, Lord, we want to come away from this place today knowing that we will be in the wedding supper of the Lamb. So please bless with your presence and the practicality of all that happens now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. All right, God bless you. We'll return promptly after we've served each other and we'll have the, uh, the uh, emblems of the Lord's body and his blood here in the sanctuary. Once again, the men and the couples will be in the dining area. We have two separate compartments there and the ladies will be in the um, chapel.